Hi, some of you have met me earlier at lunch. I'm Tim Egan. I'm on the Alliance for Community Media Northeast Board. I'm part of the program committee. But I'm really excited about this conversation because it's with three people that I count as friends. I highly respect them as professionals. And I have been part of two of their boards. Um, and talking to another one about developing boards. So when this topic came up, I was like, wait, I got the perfect group of people. I hope you will think that as well. I'm just gonna position myself out of the way over here. Um, so while we all think about how to develop an organization, your board is an integral part of that development. And I think um, all of them have a different point of view from developing boards uh, and based on their history. Um, when I met Holly Groshner, she was the uh, president and CEO at Vermont Public Television. I was part of the community advisory board, not your board of directors, um, my, through my role at um, then Linden State, which is where I met Donna, which is my representation on the Catamount board with Jody. See how this all gets really small? But what I was impressed by with Holly was the importance of not just having a board of directors that oversaw the station, but having this community advisory board that kept them, the station, integrated with the community. They would share with us their programming slate, their community initiatives, their marketing initiatives, and ask us for feedback before they sort of rolled some of the stuff out or as they were beginning to roll that out. And the fellow advisory board members were from all different walks of life. Um, you know, I, I was there, even though I was a video guy, I was an educator, but there were folks there with no video experience at all because not everybody that watches public television is a TV producer or a TV instructor. So I thought that was very interesting and, and very respectful. Um, in a minute, I'm gonna let her tell you a little bit more about what she's doing with access to, to broadband and. and um, I think digital equity is an essential part of what community media needs to have as a partner because we can't distribute our content if people don't have smart infrastructure that's responsive to the, con to the consumer. And what I mean by that is, are my upload speeds and download speeds working? Can I get other information besides just a video signal? So, um, Holly, do you want to tell everybody what you're up to now so they have a little base of understanding of where you've been coming from? If you want me to. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so, yes, I was the president of Vermont Public, now Vermont Public, Vermont Public Television. It was my strategy to bring radio and TV together because in the public media world, your platform does not define you, your content does. So um, that is an experiment that seems to be extremely successful. Uh, hats off to Scott Finn. And uh, then I am really a telecom lawyer in disguise. So I have 30 years of working with the FCC and the regulations behind the FCC and all things related to distribution of cell phones and broadband. So when the state set up the the organization to distribute ARPA funds. Anybody heard of ARPA funds? Um, I was fortunate enough to be appointed by the House to be their representative on the committee to distribute those funds. And um, we're looking at 232 million right now, but we are applying for what's called bead funds right now. And bead funds will be hopefully many millions more. Um, my personal focus, I live in a little place called Cookville, Vermont, and when COVID hit, the school principal couldn't support her students without taking buses into the community with Wi-Fi wi -Fi distribution on the bus. And we talked about how many households were completely disconnected from um, media. Um, during COVID, and that's how I got involved in 
equity and broadband. And that's, a lo and that's enough of the story, I guess. <laughs> well, I think it's a, it's a perfect part of the story because it's about how our communities not only get information through our channels, but how they get it through the infrastructure. Um, when I had, was teaching, well, I still am teaching, at uh, now Vermont State University, Lyndon Johnson, Castleton, Vermont Tech, all one big happy family now, or soon to be happy family. We're, try, we're getting happier, as we'll see. Um, Donna will keep checking my pulse to see if I'm happy. But Donna was teaching in our uh, communications program, communications and journalism, where we have News 7. Um, really a long-term project that maybe you can talk about, Donna and David and, and, and Darlene and David and how they built that, but the idea that a community news-oriented institution in a place where there's not a lot of communications. The Northeast Kingdom is somewhere between you know, Montreal, Burlington, Manchester and Portland, so there's no big major media outlet. How is news shared? Um, so it was refreshing to, to see someone that came from network news to want to teach young people about how to be a committed journalist. Now at Pinkerton Academy, uh, building out their video program, there's a challenge for her to think about creating a board. And so the conversation about how do we look at, and that's what we'll talk a little bit once I, I introduce everybody, uh, how you look at what is a board, good board member? What, how do you find board members when you haven't done this before? Jody and Holly have. Donna's, I think, going to be a little learning here, a little board school. Um, but tell them a little bit about why you wanted to move to Pinkerton after being in media and being in college, why you wanted to go back, into the, back to high school. Hello, everybody. I'm Donna Koskala. Um, so as Tim was saying, I'm a video production uh, teacher at Pinkerton Academy, which is a, the largest independent, I like this to share this little fun fact, largest independent high school in the nation. We have over 3,000 students in our school. Um, it's a private school, but we are the public high school for five communities in southern New Hampshire. Um, I grew up in that area. That, that was one of my reasons for coming going back, like people always ask me all the time, why did you leave a, I was a tenured associate assistant professor at um, Vermont State University. They're like, well, why did you leave to go to high school? Um, so I had a multitude of reasons, um, some of which are probably obvious, you know, Lyndon's gone through some transitions over the past few years for those of you from Vermont. Um, and I was a little nervous about that. So, um, and I'm from New Hampshire, so I wanted to get closer to my family. And, you know, uh, sharing love of, of creating is, you know, whether it's journalism or film or commercial production, whatever it is, has always been a passion of mine. And this opportunity was a way for me to try something different um, and, and maybe bring some of my journalistic background. So I spent 12 years at WMUR in Manchester, New Hampshire as a news producer um, and associate producer um, for a show I was a newscast producer for seven or eight years, and then I switched to a show called New Hampshire Chronicle, which is a magazine sort of lifestyle show. And then I went to Linden in 2010 um, and got hired because I went to Linden for my undergrad. And so I was, I was approached by then um, David Ballou and Darlene Bolduck, who were running the program and were my former professors, to bring my journalistic experience to Linden and to add to their their program. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that, Lyndon um, at the time, and it's, it's a changed sense, but at the time when I started in 2010, did a daily live newscast for the Northeast Kingdom. The only um, news here in Vermont, um, uh, commercial broadcast news other than public television, public radio, was the commercial entities that are all located over here on this side of the state. To say that they didn't come over to the Northeast Kingdom that much is probably safe, um, unless there was some huge story happening, like when Burke Mountain got bought out and all that fiasco happened that I know the, the stations would come over, but mostly the day-to-day -day news happening in that little corner of Vermont was going unnoticed or uncovered. Um, and so the program at Linden was really unique in that we wore the community media. We, we did a daily live newscast that was shared out on um, which was called Kingdom Access Television. Is it still Kingdom Access? So the, the community media for the Northeast Kingdom. And so that was a great opportunity for us to give back to the community, to give the community their daily dose, to teach future journalists, you know, and to, to give them a, what we used to refer to it as a lab, 
um, but it was a real life day to day experience of what it was like to be a working journalist while providing a service to the to the community at large. I think at the time uh, we were serving some four or five thousand households that could get our our show through um, Kingdom, Kingdom Access Television. Um, loved that experience. I went through it as a student, um, but as I said. The school went through some changes and I felt it was time to move on and I came across this opportunity um, at Pinkerton Academy where I am now where I'm trying to build a program that traditionally had been a film program. My, the prior instructor was a film guy. I'm a television broadcast person. So I, I've been evolving the program. I started in the fall of 2019 we all know what happened by January of 2020, or March of 2020. Um, so my first year, and, and going from college to high school, if anyone's ever been in education, it's, a, it's vastly different. And so dealing with that change, and then all of a sudden, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and I have to totally kind of put all my ideas on hold while we sort of progress through the pandemic. So getting outside of the pandemic, you know, within the last two or three years, I'm really starting to look at the program and finding ways to meld that um, those who probably still want to do movies, but I'm also starting to build a broadcast program and I'm working um, and have worked with our community access channel in um, Derry, um, Derry Community Access Media um, and building a board. So we have an advisory board that um, serves every career and technical education program at Pinkerton. Um, we have to have, it's actually required by the state that we have an advisory panel that supports us to make sure we're doing what, what um, the industry needs. We're teaching the kids what they, you know, what the industry needs, and they're keeping me accountable for updated equipment. Are you using the right, you know, equipment? Are you teaching the kids what they know? So I've str I've struggled. I mean, COVID was part of that with building my my advisory, and so that's sort of my background is that I'm in this process of trying to build out a strong advisory board that will help support the program and grow the program in the, in, in a way that is uh, positive and and that is hopefully helpful to in the end, the students. Thank you, Donna. Um, and then starting out in the advisory world when I was at Linden teaching with Donna, um, I was asked by my department chair to be on the advisory board of this exciting little organization, as he called it, Catamount Arts. Some of you in Vermont may know it a bit. Some of you may know it well. Uh, I call it the preeminent arts organization in the Northeast Kingdom and northern, New Hamp in northern Vermont and New Hampshire because they actually now do programming in New Hampshire. Um, Jody Freed is the executive director there. He is as well the executive director of the Vermont Leadership Institute. Is that your official title? Sure. Director, not executive director. Just He just directs everything. Um, I had opportunity to then be on his board. I think I'm on my fifth president without you convincing me to be a president of your board, which... Um, Trust me, I would love to, you know I would, but I think I was better served as your treasurer during COVID. There's lots of COVID stories to be had here. Um, but what I love about Jody is that he understands not just the love of arts for creators, but how important arts is as economic development, is as tourism, is as a motivator for businesses to be engaged in their community when they can partner with arts. Um, I was proud to work with Jody. We actually have a mobile stage that's at Dog Mountain. Some of you may, may or may not know. I'm going to have Jody talk a little bit about that. The, we created, then we were able to have opportunity to get through another grant, have a mobile stage. So now two mobile stages going into the community, helping communities put on festivals, concerts, anything that drives folks into small town, rural New Hampshire, Coasson, Crafton County, um, small town, Northeast Kingdom. Um, and so I got an understanding of his sense of business, his sense of arts, and his sense of community. Jody, talk a little bit about um, maybe the mobile stages and how that's been something that's helped Catamount sort of change its infrastructure from a arts facility-based arts organization to sort of a wide-ranging nonprofit. And I'm going to go close that back door. Okay. Hi, everyone. Jody Freed. Um, and as Tim said, I've been executive director at Catamount Film and Arts uh, for 15 years now, which is, uh, it's, time has flown. And uh, for the past five years, um, been at the Vermont Leadership Institute, but also during that time period, still do and have served on many, many different boards. Um, 
Uh, I'll just say before I get to specifically the mobile stages, um, in terms of career, spent about a decade in um, private corporate world working in finance, then went an entrepreneurial route and went into business for myself in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont um, for about 10 years um, before joining um, Catamount. And I came to Catamount really as an engaged business leader um, community development was my interest, uh, art was my passion, um, but not as an artist, um, the vehicle was through community development and how could we create an ecosystem across northern Vermont, northern New Hampshire that was at its um, core based around creativity um, and how could we build the economy throughout that region um, with that at its core. And it, it, that's what we've spent the past 15 years focusing on and one of the initiatives that Tim brought up um, was the mobile stage, which was an experiment. We started, uh, we, we got one stage, we worked with the college, and so there's a music business industry program at the college, and we um, decided that we would create a workplace um, training ground for the college students um, where we brought our professional engineers um, with our mobile stage, our sound light equipment, essentially the um, the, the lab, um, the students served as the roadies to some degree. Uh, we had nine of them this past summer to give you the scale of it that worked with us. Um, and we did had now have two stages, one based out of New Hampshire, one based out of Vermont. This summer we did 70 outdoor concerts for about 45,000 people, all free music spread across the region. Five nights a week there was um, a free concert going on that anybody could attend. And we had lots of people that would travel around, especially retired, they would base their entire week's entertainment traveling to different communities. But what's cool, if you look at um, economic spending data and you look at the impact that that has, you know, a Vermont resident will spend about $29 per capita or per person when they go to an event. Um, if they're traveling from outside the region, that doubles, and it's about $60 per person. So if a family of four goes into a community um, to attend one of those events, there's a, there's a real economic impact that takes place there, and that's before you add any multipliers of the money turning over in the economy based on people's salaries. So we've spent a lot of time building out those programs, but come to this with a lens of how do we build at its core um, communities that have um, arts, culture, creativity, um, right central to um, what we're doing. And I think that uh, the work that all of you are doing um, in your sector is critical to that. Um, one other thing I would mention is that in 2016, the Vermont legislature formed the um, Vermont Creative Network, and I don't know how many of you have participated with that, but it was actually a legislative initiative to, to mirror the farm to plate network that had been so successful in agriculture. Um, and I've chaired that steering committee for that board now since it was put, um, put in place by the legislature, and we have a strategic plan for the whole state of Vermont. Um, and we look across sectors, and, and one of the things I think of when I think of your group and think of board members, think of um, the future for the work that you're doing, um, is how can we activate that entire network so that the content is being driven locally? Um, so that you have this constant fountain through our communities of our art artists, our creatives that are working in our community that are then flowing um, through your screens out into families, households, because we've built out the infrastructure. Um, and so I, I think there's some real opportunity there because per, uh, per capita, I think Vermont has the highest concentration of artists and writers and creatives of anywhere um, in the country. Um, and so we should be taking advantage of that for the content that we're putting on our screens. So I just wanted to sort of have a little bit of a, an introduction, um, but also have it be a little more personal because I think board development is personal. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask them a few questions. Um, if you are um, ignited by a conversation, raise your hand. I'm gonna leave some time at the end for Q&A as well, but I don't want this to just be us talking at you. We'd love to have you talk with us. So if you do have questions while uh, the panelists are responding, just you know, raise your hand and I, I think they're all comfortable to engage that. I think part of, for me, so um, one um, the other day said, you, oh, you're, you're busy, what don't you do? And uh, I'll answer that with a simple question, which is, you know, what don't you want to do? I want to do everything, and so I don't say no. I just have to manage my time. And I think part of 
organizations trying to find board members are people that are willing to carve out some time out of their life. Um, I forget the philosopher, there's a great philosophy you're talking about that there's your home and there's your work and then there's the third place that you enjoy. And in the British philosophy, it's the pub system. For me, it's within nonprofit arts, nonprofit groups, arts, entertainment, economy, uh, environment. I just think it's an important part. So I'm probably a good board member. You can, tell, you can kick me later if I, if I am not one. Um, what is a good board member? You know, maybe Jody and Holly, you can start because Donna is listening, figuring out how to build one. Um, Holly, you've done this at a high level. Public television has a lot of light on it. You know, your board members are usually folks um, well established. How do you, what is a good board member? What are some traits that you look for? So I've thought about this topic, Tim, since you asked, and um, I have to come at it from a different angle. Are, are there any executive directors in the room? Oh, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, how many hats do you wear? Let's, let's begin to count them. So um, my thought about who's a good board member is intimately tied to what is it you want your organization to do? Um, don't take the low-hanging easy fruit. You know, Mrs. Smith has been giving for 30 years and she's such a nice lady and she makes cookies for your group and all sorts of things like that. Um, those people are important to whatever you're doing and maybe they belong on your board, but maybe they don't. Um, what you really need to know is what is your vision for the group, whatever your group is, what is your vision and how can you articulate that effectively to the people you meet to motivate them to want to join that mission? Because what you need to do is build a group of people with a shared vision. Some boards need to come together and build a vision as board members, right? And I had the privilege of um, during COVID, blending boards between public radio and public television. And that was fascinating um, because they were very different organizations. Um, but I had, a, I'll tell you a little story. I had a very, I, I built a, a new board when I came into public television. I didn't pick the board in the broadband, state broadband group I'm on. That was a political process. So I'm gonna talk about public television a little bit. Um, I had a terrifying moment after I got my board seats filled. A consultant came in and said, why are you here to each of those board members? And the board member said, I like Holly. Uh-oh. <laughs> that was bad news. Um, it is important for your board members to feel some camaraderie with you, absolutely. But they actually have to identify with your mission, most importantly. So um, yes, you want people th that are willing to, to vote some time, but you need to understand what kind of board member you need. Are you looking for a working board? Do you need somebody who can help with the accounting in your group or knows what good governance looks like? Lawyers are always handy. Um, or do you need people who are going to reach out in the community and generate, I'm going to say value, whether that's dollars, content, uh, connections, opportunities. One of the most connected guys in the entire state is Jody Freed. And I mean, there just isn't anybody who doesn't want to work with Jody Freed. But he's very good at generating excitement about what he's doing. And so those are the people you want that get excited about your vision. So then the good question is, who do you look for, Jody? So I, I think I'll just build on what Holly said, and, and 
I think intersectionality is critically important. So everything is just so connected in today's world across systems. Um, and so that value that Holly was talking about, as you think about your mission and you think about your board, where are there connections across the different systems in, in the, where, whatever your footprint is, um, where you can find leverage and create value. And, and as you start to identify those different intersections, so it might be that there is an opportunity um, within the, the hospital world for you to be featuring healthcare providers on your stations. Then you want to make sure you have somebody who's very well connected within the nursing or the healthcare provider world on your board who can then act as an ambassador and get into that system to bring those folks in and participate with you. What happens over time is if you identify those places of intersectionality and there's value and it's shared value, that then you'll start to see support in other ways because as they see that you're an important partner, as they see that because of the feature that you're doing on their healthcare providers that the morale within their staff is going up, that as they see that their recruitment numbers are going up because there's feature television or feature um, you know, exposés they can put up in, in their recruitment ads. Um, then all of a sudden, when you go to ask for sponsorships, when you go to look for underwriting for conferences, you're going to have partners there that are also going to be willing to put dollars forward. And so over time, you develop relationships. But I, I think f what I would say is most important in the work that we've done on a lot of the different boards that have been successful that I've worked with is we've looked for those intersections across systems where you can identify where you want to, based on your vision within your organization and the mission of your organization, develop relationships, and then you start there. Um, the individual piece, I agree, um, It's you have to have trusting relationships and you have to get there. I, I would say a big thing with board members and part of the expectation, and, and it's why Tim is a good board member, is is a board member with an executive director or someone running an organization has to be someone who, who will return the phone call. And if they're not willing to at least make that commitment to you or that starts to break down, you know you have a problem. And, um, and as an executive director or a director, you want to also respect their time and only call them when you need to. Um, but when you do, it's that when that phone rings, you know you're going to get a phone call back. And so when you see an opportunity in that place of intersection where there is something within their sector, they know when the, you call them that it's not only good for the organization that you're calling from, but ultimately it's going to be good for them long term because it's important to their organization and the sector they represent. It creates a balance that over time creates a good board. And that's a Donna. Uh, part of your challenge then is probably at, a, at Pinkerton when they say start a board, you're going to get a lot of alumni. That's great, but the alumni are not really what you need. You need Correct. folks outside of the institution. How have you been thinking about approaching that? Well, well, my initial approach was who do I know personally from my experience in the industry um, in trying to tap those uh, resources. I didn't give much thought to the whole idea of, of you know, um, having looking looking for board members that were, you know, willing to make that time commitment. Or I was just sort of, honestly, I have been just going like, I just need people to show up. <laughs> I just need someone who's going to show up to my meeting so I don't get in trouble. Um, you know, because it is a required part of what we have to do. Um, but listening to some of the, the these guys talk about, you know, what to really look for is making me go, hmm, who are the people that want to be invested in, and in, in, you know, and, it, and it's tough in media um, to get, because me media is a very, you know, busy, challenging, you know, if I try to find, like, I have a friend that I went to Linden with, his name is Christensen, he runs Live Free or Die Films. And I've tried to tap him for my board, but he's in, he literally is in Hollywood, you know, and he's a New Hampshire guy, but I went to college with him, I know him, and I, you know, that's the kind of person I would want to, but I think, I think I need to work on my vision, just hearing you guys. Like, what is the vision of my program? And that will hopefully lead me to other folks that could support that vision. Um, so that's been my struggle, is that right now it's just been like, well, I just need people to show up. But if I'm not presenting them with something concrete, like what that they're going to want to support, then why would they show up? 
right? So I, I really think I, for me, just listening is, is to these guys and thinking, okay, well now I need to have a plan and a vision and then find the people who would want to work with me to support that. So I think, thank you for that, because and, and I, I'm sort of using you as an interesting guinea pig here, because I think this is helping you, but it's also helping everybody else who might be in that same boat as you are that is trying to build an organization. Um, um, in the variety of com com comments that you guys sent me, um, we talked about, um, you know, when you focus on a board member, is it a science or an art? You know, is the science skill sets, is the art relationships? Um, let me reverse the order. Jody, how important, you know, do you, do you have to flip a coin when you're thinking about where you're at with, you need to make an addition to your board? Um, what's more important, the skill sets or, you know, or the relationships, the science or the art? Um, so, as a person who has been focusing so much time for a long time as to where those two things come together, this is kind of, I think, the, the perfect question as you think about the board, because the good boards, there's a magic that occurs. Um, and I, I don't know that you can separate those two things. I think that some of it, um, it does come down to whether or not there can be healthy relationships, and you can build boundaries. You can have ground rules within your communication and your group. Um, and there is certainly, um, I think, within boards, uh, you know, that disagreeing is is a good thing, um, and having conversation. But it has to lead to to, to moving forward. Um, and and by that, I mean action. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean always growth. It might mean that you have to go a different direction completely. So um, I, I think the art and the science, is, it's a fascinating question. I, I'll give you a, a few examples of the way we try and work with this is um, uh, there's a board that I chaired and that has been um, a really instrumental to the Northeast Kingdom. It's called the Northeast Kingdom Collaborative, um, where we do the alignment of all the strategic plans for the Northeast Kingdom's economic development and community development. And there's all of these different overlaying districts, and there's the different territories, and there's these different organizations that all have these different plans, and how do we bring them together? So what we did then in that case, the science of this is we created a board diagram where we identified the different industry sectors that we wanted to have represented, the different geographic sectors. We indicated there were some non-voting board members that we wanted to have be a part of that, where maybe there was a conflict of interest or there was a, a relationship where it couldn't be from the standpoint of um, our finances or other reasons, we, we couldn't have them as voting, but we could have them as advisory board members. There were institutions that were in our region that we felt the institution actually needed to have representation. Um, so it wasn't even just a sector, it came down to an institutional level. And we laid that all out and we did it, we, we did it in a nice diagram where we have different concentric circles, but it really painted a picture for us and it didn't mean we couldn't make exceptions from it, but it created that science piece as to how do we approach that to make sure we're considering every one of these different sectors, these different systems where there's overlap and opportunity, and again, back to intersectionality. And, and we've done a very similar thing at Catamount, um, and I, we try and do that at any board where I'm participating, um, and we do it at different levels is that science piece, creating that um, some sort of a tool to help you get an inventory of what your board members members are um, from a standpoint of skills, sectors, industries. Um, the, the art side of it then I think comes down to the individuals that are involved. Um, some of it's relationship based, some of it is commitment. Um, and I think that there's a reality that we've all seen really play out over COVID that we have to understand, which is that the ebb and flow of people's commitment is very much dependent on the world they're living in. And so there has to be some expectations about that. And then part of the art piece of that is also just being able to have really honest conversations with board members. If they're gonna step back for a period of time, are they gonna step back in? If they're not, um, or if they don't know, you need to know that if you're running the organization or trying to move an organization forward. And you need to, if their answer is they don't know, then you need to stay in constant contact with them to find out where they stand. Um, you can't just let it go indefinitely or you'll end up with, having a board of all folks who step back and where you don't know where they stand is a worst case scenario from a leadership perspective. 
So on that point, Holly, you know, part of the challenge of public television in most people's mind, and maybe I'm, I'm, I'm sinking it down to my mind, is the challenge is always about fundraising and is a board folks that have relationships with access to capital. But just folks that have access to capital aren't the only type of relationships that you can have board members build on. Before you merge the organizations, you know what? What was the important part of of non-cash relationships? You're like, okay, I have a bank president that you know I want someone who's going to say to their their employees, hey, let's support Vermont Public Television. What other types of assets can these relationships bring, and what specific ones did you sort of look for that related to your channel? So I think media for communities is very dependent on visibility. And so the relationships you pick have to support or have, a, have an objective of visibility. And Jody mentioned that in mapping out um, who should be on the board, sometimes it might be an institution or some kind of key player or recipient of your media product so that you have real feedback and a conduit. But I, I want to go back to what Jody said and put it in the framework that I'm used to. You really need to decide what your matrix is. If, if, you, if you're not familiar with the term board matrix, um, you need to Google it and uh, ma make your plan because Art and science, I actually think that you first you lay down your needs in science. I don't particularly like this use of the word science, but science as in what skill, set. s skill sets or, or technical capacities do you need on your board? And then from the people you can find that fit the science, then you have to build on who's got relationships. If you can get board members that have both, you're so far ahead. And sometimes certain skill sets don't lend themselves to relationships. Um, if you just play need an accountant on your board or an auditor so that you can, some of those people are very in very quiet worlds. Some of them are not. I mean, some of the, some of the accountants I know are the most active community members in their sphere. But you have to be realistic about who you can get. So. Um, when you talk about money, um, sometimes, okay, I'm going to be, uh, permission to be crass, everybody is going to give me a get out of jail free card, okay? I think Jody said it right. If you are truly building an invigorated, alive organization, it's going to be um, inspiring to the people who are involved and they're going to give. Um, when we merged radio and TV, everybody was so afraid that the revenue stream would sink because a lot of people were giving to both. It did not sink. It increased by 30%. Why? People saw the capacity. They saw the potential, and they got excited about it. And that was that's great. So... I, in choosing board members, you know, I'm, I, I'm at literally going through my Rolodex of board mem members I have known and loved. Um, you have to be careful. The people who are known to have a lot of money get asked all the time. And you have to have a really good reason why that person who's visibly you know, well, in, has the capacity, as they say, um, is going to pick your board. And you have to know why that person should be a board member and not a donor. It, it, be sure that you're sorting out whether you have a project or a program that's perfect for, for a particular donor. And this is the stuff of, you know, development, the development world or whether you have a person who's going to be excellent at informing and creating and building on your mission. That's very, very different things. I would say that you have to be realistic 
about trying to get every board member to be a donor at some level. One of the things that gets asked in grants a lot and one of the things you need to be able to say to people is that all of your board members give. And sometimes we're a little fuzzy about what that means, give something. And so um, I, I can say for a fact that I've never gone out and asked for somebody to be a board member just because they had a lot of money, ever. It's just not, I, I, you have, I don't know how you, would you agree? Um, I, I feel a little bit like, I mean, I'm very nervous when I start talking to somebody about um, being on the board. First of all, you're talking about somebody, if you're an executive director, that person's gonna be your boss. So, you know, be, be aware, you want their critical capacity, you want their education, you want their passion, and you're going to live with it because you're about to get married. And that's what it's really kind of about. And then you have to think about, you're not just getting married to that board member, you're creating a family, a family of board members. And it's really wise to know if, um, you know, so-and-so has a positive relationship with the people who exist on your board or whether they know each other. One board member said to me point blank at the point of conversation about being a board member, I want to know who's on your board and who's fun. If you don't have fun people on your board, I am not doing it. Yeah. Was your answer? Yeah, actually, one of the terms we use, I, I take the mic if you're recording, but it, it, we use the fun factor when we talk about boards. And um, I, it, it's interesting to see the level of engagement if the fun factor comes up. So right now we're doing our gala this week. It's tomorrow at Catamount. And yeah. <laughs> but we have a lot of board members highly engaged because they're having fun and they're looking forward to that night. They're up on, you know, they, they've shown up to like get up on the ladder and hang the lights. Um, and, you know, I, a hospital or a healthcare CEO up there on the ladder and I'm holding it going, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but ha having such a great time and having fun um, in that moment and that's, you know, that it, it, I don't think you can um, overstate how important the fun factor is um, at some level for groups that are going to have to spend time together over t you know extended periods of time. So you, you want to be really deliberate about that, whether that's having retreats, whether it's having dinners or barbecues, figuring out other ways for people to spend time together to have fun. Can I add something? Yeah. This is for yeah. you, Donna. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm loving it. So, so, so Donna talked about her former colleague, classmate or something, who's got a name in the industry, oh, yeah. but, but lives away. If I were gonna sit down and assess that, I'd wanna know whether that person can bring some fun into your group because they have special something, mm -hmm. okay? If they're gonna attend by Zoom, you have to be aware that while Zoom is a magical thing, it does not build the kind of board, in my mind, that is as cohesive and as effective and as dedicated as if you're in person at least some of the time. I sit on the board of the Vermont Arts Council, um, that, and I sit on the board of Vermont Law School, or Vermont Law School and Graduate School now, and um, the challenge in those groups is pe our people are distributed, and the conversations are real, but they're limited. And I think the opportunity for true deep conversation is greatly enhanced by in-person events. And nothing is better for board build building than having something to work together on where people are having a little fun. So Donna, with knowing that you're product of your board is youth education. How do programs that you have with students make it fun for board members? Are there things that you've been thinking about that, you know, maybe this is your road test pitch to a board member? Tell us that little pitch out loud. Yeah. Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm off the cuff here just thinking about this, but like one of the discussions or one of the things that my students get excited, my students get excited about are like when they can compete or take part in a festival or have their work seen in some way. So I'm thinking in terms of like, okay, could we create our own film festival where the board is involved with helping to organize and plan that? And again, this is just coming to my mind as we talk. Yeah, no, I love it. No, I'm, I'm a former journalist. I can handle it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, the thinking about like, well, how like my me the meetings I have had aren't very fun and we don't do things that are super fun other than share ideas and have a conversation um, so yeah I'm thinking about like ways in which or how could I bring that element of fun in and what kinds of things could we arrange and plan um, to make it fun and I, a film festival is what comes to mind because my students when they do compete in these competitions outside of my program they get excited and they're they're you know they, they want to take part in it and so the wheels are turning and thinking that that could be our you know maybe our thing that could be a little bit fun that might engage and I have you know board members on my list that I think would be in, in would totally be all over that so that that's exciting thank you for sharing and let me put you on the spot um, uh, I come to this not just as someone that's been on a board and interested in it. Um, I had the pleasure and be, to be elected uh, for two terms to the Board of Governors for the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences in New England. And luckily for me, my board members are relatively easy to find because it's folks who are, you have to be a member of the academy, which means you um, work at a station or a production company, you enter into the competitions, um, you're involved in the sort of the ethics of journalistic integrity and, and community give back. Um, but it's a challenge when you're calling the, the Donnas and the Hollies of the world who are so busy in their job to then say, do you want to be on this board which oversees the recognition of your industry? And a lot of people go, oh, Emmy board, sounds exciting. Other ones go, or it's a Groucho Marx, right? Do I want to be a member of the organization that'll have me? So it's hard to find board members who can give the time. Um, part of what I looked for was folks that found the ethos of the organization, you know, giving back to the community, journalistic integrity, excellence in broadcasting. If that's what they had as a paramount interest, personally, they made a good board member of the organization. And then, as, as Holly sort of alluded to, you know, what are the skill sets? Great. I can't have news people call sponsors for an Emmy event. They can't do that. It's a conflict of interest. I need folks that are in advertising or marketing or promotions. Right? If we were going to create awards, folks on a, on a board that are going to oversee awards committees, they have to be folks that understand how to make products. So they're creators, they're writers, they're producers. They know how to evaluate what is good writing, what is good editing, what is good audio. Um, so it's a combination. And then what uh, both Holly and, and Jody referred to is the fun factor, and you were so right with Zoom. Um, the Television Academy used to have all of our board meetings in person. We all shared lunch. And there's something, I don't say magical, but something really personal sitting across from someone and sharing a meal and discussing the issues. And you create that personal bond. You understand that someone likes peppers and someone's a vegetarian and someone likes this. And you, but you learn about that person and you create a connection with them. And then as a president of the board, you're able to go, OK, I understand this person a little better and I know what I can ask them or what I can't ask them what they're willing to do, what they're not willing to do, what they're good at, what they're not good at. And what Zoom during COVID did is, because we're a board in New England, it's really hard to get everybody together one time a month. So now we have one physical board meeting where all the new board members for the new year come and all the rest of them. And I definitely notice the sort of, I'm in, I, I check in, I, I respond to what I'm supposed to do, and I check out, there's no, there's less collegiality, I think is the phrase I'm looking for. Everybody's night, everybody's professional, but it's less personal. Can I offer you something on that topic, Tim? Love it. it, it this comes to me, um, so we did the merger discussions during COVID, and um, that required getting 34 people oh. together on Zoom 
and having them actually make good decisions, right? Um, even when they were from two different camps. And I have to credit Scott Finn for this because he's a production journalist at heart and I am not. So you all have the means to make a Zoom meeting engaging. You should use your talents to, um, so, we, so we had a team that put together these board meetings. They were happening every two weeks. And we had a topic for the board meeting and we had speakers, a video, a responsive Q&A like right on the spot. We had, uh, there would be, Zoom has features, so do other providers, but Zoom has features where you can build a grid based on everybody's anonymous reaction. Uh, do, you know, do a PowerPoint type picture. And um, that kind of interaction where everybody has to be accounted for really helped keep the meetings stimulating, people engaged, and they talked about the meetings after the meeting was over, so. I just want to ask, I just have to, I'm giggling here because I'm thinking about the months I spent having class every day via Zoom oh. and having to find these ways to engage. I, we had this rule where we couldn't force them to put their cameras on, oh. which was torturous because I didn't know if they were awake or asleep or you know what they were doing. Or but, even there. Or even there, right. They, they certainly dialed in, but like coming up with these ways, I, yeah, I, I was just laughing because I was like, oh, that was my life for like a year um, during COVID, trying to come up with ways to engage students in, 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 the par and, and in taking part. You're, you're ready for your work. Right, right, right. <laughs> I must have learned a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I've got a couple, one more or two more questions and then we, we want to hear from you all. Um, Part of building out the board is also keeping folks involved and developing leadership. Um, I wouldn't say it's me. I'd say maybe it's half me and half the people, but I'm very proud to say the last four of the five presidents of the Television Academy Board were people that I recruited to the board when I was president. How hard is that, Jody, to develop leadership? I, I'm picking you specifically because your other, your other executive role, your other director role, excuse me, um, to build a pipeline, right? You have the board members and are they destined for the vice president, the secretary, the treasurer, the president? How do you build longevity of board members so that you, when you find someone good, you can keep them? You know, I would have responded to this very differently before the pandemic, because um, I really think a lot has, has changed and, and just within board recruitment and keeping folks on boards. And I think there has to be, a, I, I think we have to be just really realistic about it because um, people have, have done a lot of prioritization in their lives. Um, so uh, whereas before, um, and like Tim, you said you're what, on your fifth term, um, you know, this in term limits is a question that I know that you you, you had prompted us with, but um, I, just, I think it just realistically how long people are going to stay engaged or give is going to come directly back to how strong your mission is. So, um, and figuring out who is going to be in that pipeline for leadership, it, it's really going to come down to today, I think more than anything else is going to be people who are passionate supporters of the mission. Um, and so, uh, it, and I don't know that I would have responded that way five years ago in terms of that question. I think it, things have really changed. I think that in, you, you're going to need to identify, and it might not be the individuals who you would typically think of as the president, vice president, treasurer of an organization that are extremely passionate that with some skill development, with some leadership development, they can get to that point and they are going to be the ones that are going to carry things forward. And so identifying people who have your mission in their heart, who you see that really burning with, and then being working with them to make sure they get those skills that they need to be able to do that job, I, I think is the path forward to this one, given where we're at. So I don't, I don't know if I answered that the way you were looking. No, you answered it the 
the way you wanted to, and that's I'm comfortable with that. Uh, Holly, this is sort of the same question for you. You know, how did you keep good board members? Separate the wheat from the chaff, right? There are bad board members. I've had them uh, on occasion. I may have been one. But it really, it was a, for me. It was a matter of time. I, was, I, I said yes, and I shouldn't have said yes. I couldn't commit fully. Um, how do you do that as well? How do you nurture leadership, knowing this is a good person? That I could see them being my board chair one day again, because you're trusting your <laughs> you're trusting your career with them. That's right. It, it, so I think it's um, important just to stop for a moment and say, yeah, that's your job as executive director to identify skill sets and deficits and sort of have a plan. You want to talk to your board chair about what your vision is because your perception may not equal your board's perception. You might be seeing people in different ways. And if you are, you need to figure that out and vet that because um, you might have some conversations around board development with the group individually. So it, just acknowledge it's part of your job. Um, I think it's good to identify what bad board members are. In my world, the bad board members I've met are people who are so pleased to have something else to put on their resume. And that's really why they're there. So watch out for those guys. They, they are, you know, every now and then they pop up. I have had board members who have a sense that once they're a board member, they have a unilateral right to do one of two things. To speak for the organization or to direct staff. The, we've all, me, I, you know, with, with time and, oh, Donna, okay, <laughs> we've, we've met these folks, and you have to be able to set those parameters that Jody was talking about. Um, those are clear conversations. Um, you know, you did indicate that uh, uh, you enjoyed the public media aspect of a, of a community feedback loop. That's required in national law for public media folks, you know, those organizations that are getting federal dollars from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, it's right in the regs. But um, the, the, I have seen people come in through community support groups expressing their interest, and then you see that they have a lot of leadership capacity, and so it's incumbent on you to find a way to get them moved up the chain into and my my experience is sometimes it's just great to get that avid community leader working with somebody who's already on your board and you don't have to say anything they pull that person in so i got one more question and we want to hear from you um donna part of the challenge for you is you have a um national scope of alumni, yet you're sort of a local school, how is the challenge of geography or you know, local business, um, what are you looking for, what are you thinking about in terms of, of where do I find these people so that they can engage because their proximity helps um, and balance that with you know, skill sets. Uh, and that has been the challenge. You know, um, I've been highly encouraged by my director to bring people in, do the meetings face to face. And you know, I can't ask someone from Hollywood to fly to New Hampshire to attend a board meeting. Um, so you know, I have been focused on folks who I know I could probably get to come to me physically and be in the space. So again, that went back to my, my initial thought has always been like, well, who do I know? Who do I work with? Who have I gone to school with? Who have I been, who have I met through my various you know, experiences? And that's sort of been where I've been rooted in, in searching. But as I'm listening to all these conversations, I'm realizing that I need to switch that up. Well, that's great because I have those relationships. What are the skills and what are the, 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 the needs that I want from from my board, it's probably going to be outside of the, who I know and who I can connect with. Um, so that's, I think, where my head is sort of uh, heading, like thinking about my mission and my, my vision and really building that up and then 
saying, okay, well, with that mission and vision in mind, what do I need to support that? And where does that come from? I've already started thinking about, and I think Jody had mentioned, you know, dividing it up, like the science part. Like, I know I want someone from film. I want someone from journalism. I'd love someone from radio. Like, the different categories that I, experiences that I want to give to my students. Um, and so thinking about it in that way, I don't necessarily know people involved in all of those things. So once I have that structure in place, I think, it might be a little bit easier to figure out who, where I can go and, and who's going to, to support those or who can give me their experience and their you know, skills um, in those different sort of subcategories, I guess. Can I ask a question of yeah, you? Yeah, sure. Does Pinkerton Academy have a fundraising effort separate from your initiative? I, I would assume so, because it's a private school, um, but we are funded by the towns that serve us, um, yes. So I would go to back to- We are run by a board of trustees. Yeah, I would go back to that group and start looking for mining the relationship mm, aspect right. of the existing organization. Okay. And That's, give them some opportunity to share yeah, yeah. in the v development of this new activity. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. great. Love yeah. that. That's great advice. Yeah, and so and sort of a follow up for you is that is, is, is that also then a challenge in building out a board that you are providing education to public to pub the towns, the, the school boards or the, in those towns are also have a voice in right. what you're trying to do. Right, and so one of my other you know, thoughts as I've been trying to navigate this building of a board is who are my stakeholders? Who, who cares about what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Students, teachers, uh, students, parents, administration, and then the industry professionals that I want to give me that feedback. So yeah, I've been rolling through like who are those stakeholders? So yeah, it is a challenge because I want to, you know, I could invite parents to be on my board, but they know nothing about the industry, but they have a voice because it's their kids that are enrolled in my program. And then the kids who are learning, they ha should have a voice in that because it's their, it, it, their program. And I want them to go out and say, yeah, take you know Miss Costell's class because it's amazing experience and you get to do all these amazing things. But you know, balancing that, like w getting the industry input with the other stakeholders involved, is a challenge, and it is something I'm still working through. But thinking about tapping the board of trustees is an interesting thought that I hadn't explored. So I appreciate that advice. Can I just add one oh, thing? Yeah. Just the the actual process of board development and recruiting board members. Um, is a way to build relationships with, with those key people out there. So when you call the bank president, you might call the bank president because they've been referred from your development office, and you're calling to have a conversation with them about what you're doing, knowing that their likelihood is they're not gonna be the one to be on your board, but by them advising and you having that call and that conversation, it's an opportunity for you to share your mission with them and for them to have some input and start to have some investment in your success. And so when you then find that person, especially if it's based on the recommendations that you got, you then have two people or perhaps two organizations that are invested. Um, so that whole, the, if you approach board development and the process of recruiting folks as an opportunity into itself of relationship building, then the investment side of it, when it comes time to your organization and the value you're bringing to your community, will be much higher. Hold that mic, Jody, because I'm gonna ask you a follow-up. Donna talked about students being an important part of that voice. I know that's always been an important part for Catamount is, whether it's from, the, from Linden or Linden Institute or St. Jay Academy, having students be involved in the board. Talk a little bit about why that was so important for you for, for Catamount. I know I, I remember vividly you talking about you know making sure that we're having some type of young person representation with a bunch of you know, 40 or 50 year olds. Yeah, so we, we always have at least one student rep. It's a non-voting member. Um, sometimes we'll have up to three. Um, it, it depends. I think two is probably the magic number for our board. Uh, but what's really interesting is um, it serves multiple reasons. One, you're hearing from a voice, and at least for me, it's a voice that's coming from a completely different contextual framework. So it's a, a, they, they bring ideas and a way of looking at the world that is so different than the rest of the group because of the it, um, generational difference um, that it, it really challenges a lot of just 
the way you're looking at things. <laughs> um, and, and it might be physically how you're looking at it because your conversation with your normal board might be around a, you know, a TV screen, but the person that's in, the, the student never looks at a TV screen. The, anything they're looking at is on their wrist or it's in their hand and a little device, right? And then there's very different ways of presenting in those. So, I mean, there's that. And then I, back to the fun factor, it's really rewarding for the other board members to have students on the board and to have them there and it's fun. And for the students, it's really a matter of something that they, they take forward. We've had students who have sat on our board that then go on I mean, in their early 20s to form organizations that, you know, all of a sudden they sense leadership in themselves that they didn't know was there. They see something that's bigger than themselves. And, and you know, someday they might circle back and be the next board president from a long-term board development standpoint. They might be there in 10 years running the organization where they came in as a student rep, so. So, question, oh, right away. Well, I just am, um, I'm sorry, I've already blipped on your first name. Mike. Mike. Hi, Mike. Um, I am hearing you, and I know so many media uh, organizations have this kind of person, oversight. And in the public media world, it's the stations that are affiliated with um, universities. Yeah. Oh, woe be to them. Um, and at the time that I came into public television, um, the Federal Communications Commission was having a market of uh, frequencies, frequency licenses. And so the, <laughs> the algebra on that for a university outlet was, those frequencies are worth what? Great, let's sell them and then we can start a new medical school. Yeah, it had nothing to do with support of the, the mission or the existing organization. So um, I think the thing that in, in my mind, if you have that kind of required appointment in your organization, I think the thing to do based on, not based on direct experience, but based on what I've seen, is to out them. 
And what I mean by that is, okay, Frank, tell us about what your objectives are and let's get our finance committee or our other board met get you on a board committee with trustees or directors that are going to talk with you about the things that drive you. Um, it's better to have knowledge and awareness of the various constituents that that person is trying to satisfy than to be surprised one day when somebody comes along and says, okay, you're done. I did the math. Right, about the community media stations, that's a select board member, a school board member, you know, somebody who doesn't want to be there as part of their, it's, it's with the job title. So I don't have direct experience in the media world, but we did have an organization that I was participating in that was essentially an oversight entity for a federal funder. Um, and the group itself made a, a decision um, that we needed to go a different direction. And it took maybe three years to address bylaws, mission, to redesign the board. That organization's very different than it was before. Um, the relationship with the funder has also changed, which has created challenges. Uh, and um, and it, it, everything has changed. I would say based on what I see from the outside in the world and what you guys are all going through right now and the, is there's gonna have to be some really brave conversations about um, what it is you're trying to do long term. Um, and some of the traditional institutional funders in those relationships might change based on what you come up with there. Um, and there's also gonna be just I mean, we're in a time where things are moving so quickly. Some of these things are going to work and some aren't. Um, and so I'm a big believer in trying to figure out ways to test and pilot things on a smaller scale. Uh, and that might be a strategy to use um, as, you, as you work on some of this, which is it might be forming a subsidiary, a smaller company, a, a, a parallel organization at a different scale where you can build stuff up, try things that the existing organization can't do with a longer term goal of that informing the, long, the larger organization. I like Jody's reference to innovation. Um, if you, I know a guy who's, who, when I lived in Pittsburgh, who said, always seek to be on the seam of innovation, right? And um, how does that affect an oversight committee? Those folks really have a hard time with innovation because their programs and metrics are not set up for a new world. And actually, that was one of the, my big challenges in getting the boards to merge, is that I started going out into the media landscape and looking at convergence and getting people to come in to my board from all sorts of weird places and say, do you realize that, you know, like I, m one of my favorite things was there was a stealth organization at public broadcasting, the mothership, who um, licensed and pack packaged and licensed PBS video products for sale to other distributors. Yeah, basically eroding the donor base, right? Yeah, why watch Downton Abbey on PBS? You can have it on DVD and you can get it through your Apple TV, you can get it here, you can get it there. And you need to keep like the imagination of board members aware and alive to what's really going on. And that's challenging when you have that oversight piece because you need to, you don't want to create a firestorm of alarm, but you also want to keep that person kind of open to change and figuring out, okay, where's, where's the room we have? But Mike, you had another question. Respectfully, can I see if there's other questions? You, I, we have one in the queue. All right. Put me, put me in the queue. Well, I will save five minutes for you because you are our national president. Do I need a mic for them or the people? Okay. Yeah, just because it's so common. 
like yeah, to it's a challenge. It's an audio so challenge. I'll come here. I'll come here. So this is a really dumb question, but maybe other people feel it. Um, I have great people on my board, but how do I get them to do stuff? We're a really small organization, and as a director, I do everything. I teach. I manage our finances, make sure people get paid, do fundraising, do outreach. How do I get the rest to do stuff at meetings? There's that awkward silence, and then I end up doing it or not. I'm going to start with that because I learned two good phrases in, in being bored. Um, there's the doers or worker bees, and then there's the you should have. You should have done this, and you should have done that. And they say it, and it's like, well, that's nice that you said that, but you're not putting any skin in the game. It's wonderful to say we should have done this with a project, but you didn't get involved. So it is a challenge, and, and really what it is, is, is for me is when you find worker bees, you say, how can I help you because you're helping me? How can I find other people to be on your committee? How can I find other you know, folks that can complement your skills? But I will let the... Jody, do you want to Jody. address that? I would come I, back to the fun factor piece. So is there a way to align with your board members things that are meaningful in their lives in what they're already doing? So. Um, I, and I think this is becoming more and more of an issue around people's volunteer time. Um, we're seeing collectively with our civic organizations and our communities that volunteerism is, is dropping in terms of the overall numbers, but what you're also seeing is that people are becoming really hyper-focused on how they're volunteering, um, and which is all about alignment, right? So I, I, the reason I bring that up is you have to really identify within your board members what their individual passions are, what they want to spend time with their kids with, what they want to be doing, and you target your your ask in terms of their time, which is extremely valuable, so that it matches what's going on in their lives that's important to them. So an example of that with Catamount Arts, if I have somebody that I know has kids that are in a string program, then when I've got string events, who am I on the phone with asking to be there and helping us work on that event? <laughs> Um, and and it works it works really well and it might be that they're a teacher and they're teaching you know math and or, or um, business administration up at the college and they have a great student so when we need help it might not be the professor but we might be going to them to ask about an intern who could do the help us within the board um, so again aligning with what they have and have available in their life and figuring out how to bring that into our organization You know, you know, yeah, I, I know. I, I'm just sitting here thinking about how Zoom has kind of done us in in some ways, you know, um, because I, I both have belonged to and, and run organizations where people are very willing to attend the meeting in whatever format, but if you're trying to get them to an event, they're like, oh man, not another thing and they can't attend virtually. So um, I do think that, you know, everybody's got a style. I have a little bit of a Rambo aspect to my, <laughs> so, so I am able to say, okay, these are the 12 things that I do, and here's, here's my capacity. If you want to, this thing, if you board members want this thing to be effective, you, you are going to need to find among you the people to do this. And it should take this long, and it should be fun in this way, but okay. And so who's gonna run that? Because we just can't do that thing unless some board members are gonna do that. One, and then I'm gonna save the last question for Mike because we've got about 10 minutes left. So thanks so much, this has been really um, interesting. My name is Bobby Lucier. I'm the development director at CCTV in Burlington. Um, and something that we're, so we are trying to recruit onto our board right now, but we're also, and we're also trying to expand our fundraising. Um, we have our 40th anniversary coming up next year, so we're thinking about, about that and that big campaign. And I do see that it's a big, it's sort of a big systemic problem in the way that we typically build our boards of directors that we look for you know, communities with resources, folks that either have wealthy friends or have capacity, um, and then that does bias the work and the, and the way that that work is directed. Um, and so we do want to be 
um, thinking about bringing in folks who have a deep passion for what we do and for our programmatic work. Um, and then, you know, so what is the role then of a, of a board like that when it comes to fundraising, building up a campaign? I guess I'm, you know, do you have any success stories or tips, do's and don'ts for, you know, how to engage a board in fundraising while at the same time not making your board all about, you know, finding the resources that you need to do the work and then winding up with biases um, in, that, in that board because of that? No, no, no. Well, we uh, that would be now. <laughs> it's funny because we don't, but we. <clears throat> I think as we're thinking about recruiting, we're, we're. I think we want to be thinking more about the folks that are, you know, invested in the work and pat and, and do and and have knowledge of the work on the ground. Um, and but the biases that I'm talking about coming up are just the, you know, the same people serving on on boards that often have the same perspectives and and lack the perspectives that we need in positions of leadership in order to really change, you know, systemically change the nature of our work. So. More, you want to address that, Holly? You think you're on that? I'll take a shot. <laughs> it, 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 so this is really hard stuff because it's always the same people showing up. And, um, and in part because they're visible. So if you want to change the nature of your organization, you may need to find a way to make the kind of change you want to happen interesting and exciting to existing board members. And you might have to deploy the buddy system. One of the things that always occurs to me with um, media outlets like CCTV is why isn't there a stronger um, collaborative experience between public media and CCTV. You know, one of my thoughts is that we, there can't be too much local content. There just can't be, okay. So um, why is that not a driver for an experiment? And when you have an experiment, then you have excitement. And then when you have excitement, you get people to commit to supporting something new. Um, I can say that, uh, the, um, Vermont PBS did a collaborative experiment with the Leahy Science Center. And that was fun for the board members. Um, you know, we got together and had a party, and um, people talked about ideas and mixed it up, and that was really fun. And then people got engaged in what were the best ideas, and then the funding discussions started happening, right? and. It, it can be a great motivator when you find something new and exciting. But you are so right that you have to be careful that you're not just regenerating the same, same old group. Anything to add? John, okay. do you want? <laughs> I don't have a board. Um, yeah, I, I have a couple of thoughts I'll share. One is that I think there is a transition time with boards, um, and if you're, if you're going towards a more innovative board and a, a board that is maybe more focused on the um, on change and mission, that uh, it's going to be a really hard board to coexist with those folks who are traditional and in those roles. So, and, and you just have to acknowledge that. And there's going to be friction. Um, and whether it's a buddy system or some other level of support, you have to know that going in. Because uh, it's two different cultures is essentially what you're looking at. Uh, cultures of innovation and change, um, you know, it, it, that's different uh, than the traditional culture in a board. Um, I, the other thought, and I'll just share an example. We worked together on a project um, when you were at PBS, uh, Vermont PBS, and, and we had a, a, a Grammy-winning musician coming to town, and we worked together, and Vermont PBS helped us by publicizing and making the show, um, you know, doing promotional work and, and putting um, excerpts of the show out there, and then we used that as a vehicle um, that we offered to um, Vermont PBS to then use with donors who really, and board members who were really excited about this musician and, and their band. 
and so they got to come and we had a, a the meet and greet and 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 it was a really creative way of two organizations really helping each other out in ways that they needed at the time and so the the thought of how do you approach this it, there may be different ways in as you think about relationships and where people find value to want to support your organization. So that, that traditional donor as your board member, I, I would really challenge you in today's complex world uh, is to, to challenging that traditional assumption that the person that writes the check should be sitting at the board of directors table. Um, and it, it, it doesn't mean that that never happens. Um, but you need to be really deliberately engaged with that and thinking about other ways to, to, to approach it. Mike, you had one last question. Real, real, real quick, uh, how would you start a conversation with a board that doesn't have consensus as to whether or not it should meet in person or online? And, and that lack of consensus is causing problems in terms of cohesion, right? Senses of, I'm not saying that it's my board, but perhaps senses of resentment. I showed up, you didn't show up. Uh, this entire question of we're not all in it together comes up, I think, when you have different rules for different people. How do you start that conversation to build consensus for that meeting strategy in a post world? I'll, I'll, I'll start with my experience, which is bringing together people for a meal, you build a personal relationship. They which want to show up for a meal together. Free meal. I'm, 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 I'm going to stop there and give it to the professionals. <laughs> They're a Zoom board. It's a Zoom board that doesn't want, is not convinced that it should be a Zoom board and wants to go back. Some of them want to go back to pre COVID, some of them don't. Okay. So, Jody. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm just kind of curious how do you start that? All right. So, I uh, changed the context completely. So it's not about the Zoom call or being in person. You're gonna start by saying, okay, we're gonna do this awesome thing and this is where we're gonna do it and we're gonna get everybody together to do this and it's not necessarily related to what we do in our everyday Zoom call. So you take it out of the, the, the context of this or that and it's something completely different and it's something where you're trying to, the whole goal of it, is just to come together around relationships. For you, you're not necessarily expressing that to them, but take it out of that, because it, you're never gonna get everybody signing on if they're in those two different camps, um, and you're kind of evenly split. So just remove that, and you know, there's a, it, there is a speaker coming into the, the region that is nationally known, that is directly relevant to everything you're doing, and everybody on this board needs to come to this, and we're gonna have a party on this night, and it, it's not related to a, a meeting or anything. It's completely separate. Holly, anything to add? Are you in favor of the in-person meeting? I am, but but I'm also in favor of engaged Zoom calls. I am against the I'm against the zombie Zoom calls. So so I think there's yeah I think there's a couple of aspects to this, and you've just named them. So um, w we have. Um, governance, you know, we haven't talked about board governance at all here, but board governance is really important. Like, how many meetings can your director miss before they're, they're out? Now, very few of those rules get enforced, but they should be there. They have value when they're there. I think board governance rules should be changed now that we have Zoom World, because um, it just by logging in does not mean you were there. Um, that's one thought. The, the second thing is this idea of, of special bennies for uh, engaged board members. That's so powerful. When people um, on your board see that certain people not only had more fun together, but actually maybe got to do some things or make some decisions because they were part of something big that happened, that starts motivating people truly. And then thirdly, I would offer to you, Mike, I think you need to have a list of what is important and why to you. 
and maybe there's somebody else on the on the board that you share that list with because you kind of have to be clear of what are you trying to achieve here it's so easy to fall into the this just isn't the meeting i wanted it to be you know and being kind of uh on the you know you don't want to grouse you want to see what your trajectory would be um, I'll, I'll give Jody some credit. Um, one of the fa most fascinating things that the Catamount Arts Board does is the retreat, which is it's not just come in and strategic planning. We started out with fun exercises and icebreakers and shared food, and it just changes. It's what you're both talking about. Changes the complexity of the, the setting and takes it less about the nuts and bolts and the mission and makes it more, a little more personal, and I think people get more invested. Um, Holly Grushner. Donna Koskela, did I get it right? Koskela. Koskela, I gotta get that vowel right. Jody Fried, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate your time, your friendship, uh, sharing this with folks that I uh, believe in their mission. So you being able to give them some advice has been really important to me. So thank you. Thank you all.